Uh, gravity is what they say caused the Big Bang somehow. Gravity is what formed the planets and the sun. Gravity is what causes the planets to orbit around the sun and moons to orbit around planets. Gravity is what causes the water to stick to the planets. Gravity is what causes the tides from the moon. Uh, you know, you name it, gravity does it uh, as far as they're concerned. Yep, that pretty well sums it up. So let's get on with episode 11 of Eric Dubay, Zealot or Con Man. Cue up the music. Yeah, they can't even give you an example of an object so massive that by virtue of its mass alone causes other objects to stick to or orbit around it as they claim gravity does. You know, Eric, you might have a point there. I'm trying to think if there's some sort of an object that would fit that description. Does anybody else have any ideas? And I can't even get that straight. What is it that gravity does here? Does it keep us stuck to the Earth so it pulls things and sticks them there? Uh, yes, it does. Or, like they say the, the moon does, it causes it to orbit in a perpetual circular motion around the Earth. Yep, does that too. Glad you're catching on. So what is this gravity? I mean, some, if, it, if they want it to, it causes things to stick to it. If they want it to, it causes other things to orbit around it. When they want it to, it causes the Earth's tides to be lifted by the moon, they say. By George. I think you're getting it. Why, yes, it does. Very good. But not all of Earth's water. No, no, just the oceans. All the lakes, ponds, and inland waters, those are completely unaffected. Hey, Eric, look at the size of the Great Lakes, and then look at the size of the oceans. The tides affect all bodies of water. The bigger ones are affected more. Now, the Great Lakes do have tides, but they're only about that big. Okay, compare that to the ocean tides. Think it might have something to do with the difference in size? Just trying to help out. But the moon lifts the tides, sure, sure. And uh, gravity is why uh, spherical planets exist in the first place, because it, it causes everything to tend towards a vortex and the planets and everything spun into their current shape. That's what they say. Well, no, Eric. Large bodies, say greater than about 300 miles in size, they're so massive that they will naturally collapse into a spherical shape. All right? So that's just the way it is, man. I mean, that's a side effect of gravity it collapses into the smallest shape that it can form, and that obviously is a sphere. That's another reason why a flat plate planet cannot exist. The edges will just crunch right into the middle. And it all came about because of a godless, random, big bang, cosmic accident, and through chance evolution uh, of a blind, dumb universe, uh, animals and humans and the diversity and complexity of nature just randomly came into existence from their non-god science explanation that they're trying to get everyone to buy into with this whole heliocentric spinning ball earth mythos we've been fed for the past 500 years. Okay, so let me get this straight, Eric. You think that basically the entire heliocentric universe was set up to take God out? Um, okay, well, I don't think so. So gravity is a total subterfuge of, dense, of the, the natural laws of density. So people want you to believe that before Isaac Newton lived and an apple dropped on his head, nobody in the world had ever thought of or been able to explain why stuff falls down. Well, you know, I don't know for sure what they thought caused things to fall down prior to Isaac Newton coming out. But, you know, since Isaac Newton coming out, we do know what causes it. It's gravity. And here you can see it right now. That's gravity. That's the acceleration of gravity you're looking at from my iPad right there in front of you. The reason that objects fall down is because they are denser than the medium that they are in. 
And the reason that an object would rise up is because that object is less dense than the medium it is in. So, for instance, that's why a raindrop falls down through the air and a water, an air bubble rises up in the water. That's why a rock would fall down, but a helium balloon would rise up. It's not because gravity has an affinity for rocks and doesn't like balloons. It's because of density. It's all because of relative density. If you take a deep breath and you submerge yourself in water, you'll stay at the surface because you've just changed the density of your body. And if you exhale that breath, you're going to start to sink because you've just changed the density of your body. Gravity didn't just decide that it's got more of an affinity for now and it's going to start sucking you down to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, all about well i'm not going to go density for a couple of reasons first of all buoyancy requires gravity to work and second you want to explain how density does this yeah i didn't think so it can't so better luck next time man Gravity is just complete bullshit that Copernic at, uh, Isaac Newton made up so that Copernicus's spinning ball model would make any sense. And they said, oh, well, the reason things fall down is because there's this sucking force that pulls you to the center of massive objects. And of course, if that was the case, then we would be like magnetized to the earth and just stepping your foot off of the earth would be like taking a, a heavy magnet off of a refrigerator and stepping back would be like putting it back down again. Uh well, no, no, that's not the way it works, Eric. You see, my hand is under gravity, yet because of the muscles in my arm, I can easily move it up and down. It's really not all that difficult. Remember, Eric, butterflies can just flap their little wings and fly in defiance of gravity because they're putting energy into the system just like I am when I take steps. And of course, they don't have a single example of any mass, by virtue of its mass alone, causing some other smaller mass to spin uh, circles around or to stick to that mass because of its gravity. Now, once again, Eric, I think you may have overlooked a few things. Here's one. How about the moons of Jupiter? How about our moon? How about us standing on the surface of the Earth? How about the astronauts standing on the surface of the Moon? These are all examples of rotating objects with gravity. Glad I could help you, man. They say gravity just, just spontaneously happens when something's massive enough, and then non-massive things will either start spinning around it, like the planets, if that's what they want it to do, or they'll stick to it, like people, buildings, and the oceans, if that's what they want it to do. So gravity is their mythical magic force that causes us to stick to the mythical magic spinning ball Earth, when in reality, it's simple science, the natural physics of density and buoyancy determine that heavy things fall down and light things rise up. And they've been teaching us this crap in school since we're like seven years old, so that we'll believe that oceans and buildings and people in Australia won't fall off the bottom of a ball. Well, Eric, yeah, that about sums it up. And in fact, people in Australia do stand on the land and the Southern Oceans do stay in their basins. That's all due to gravity. Glad you got it. All right. What is, if the, the earth is flat, we can't show people visuals, but give us a mental picture. What does this plate look like that we're all riding around on, or standing on, rather. It's stationary. Sure. What does it look like, this plate? The uh, azimuthal equidistant projection map that the USGS actually uses is uh, the flat Earth map. You know, Eric, all maps are projections from the globe. Here's a handful of them right here. Would you mind pointing out which one is your map, just so that we have it straight? The UN logo is another example of it. The UN logo is actually a flat Earth map uh, with divided into 33 Masonic sections, by the way. Um, but you can just type in flat Earth map on Google, and uh, it, it's a disk shape. The North Pole is in the center. All the continents go out from there. And Antarctica, instead of being a uh, ice continent on the bottom of the globe, actually surrounds us 360 degrees. Okay, so Eric, would you mind helping me out? 
I know that the South Pole is on the Gleason's map. Would you mind showing us where it is? And how far that ice goes outwards uh, is unknown at this point. So it's a cover-up. That's what the Antarctic Treaty is all about. That's why you can't independently explore Antarctica. And when people like Jarl and Ahoy uh, try to go down there, they get turned away at gunpoint and put in prison. Well, Eric, I had never heard of this Jarl and Ahoy, but he seems like quite an interesting character. Let's see. He uh, seems to have a problem with passports and registering his vessel when he comes into countries been deported from Canada. Looks like they had uh, this sinking down in Antarctica where he lost three of his crewmates. Looks like the Chilean Navy gave a false name when contacted by radio and when they caught him he was flying a pirate flag. He's kind of an interesting character. Well, in any event, I'll let you guys read about them if you want. Thanks for bringing them to my attention. So um, there's a big uh, cover up there in Antarctica as well. I don't know how far the ice goes, whether there's an edge, a barrier, a dome, or infinite plane. Um, but what we do know is that the earth and the water is completely flat. Well, Eric, you know, this is what kind of confuses me because you can go to the South Pole anytime you want. Just pony up the $30,000 and, well, there you are. Go down and look at the penguins and everything else. See the 24-hour Antarctic sun? You know, have a blast, man. For as far as we can see and as far as we've measured, and the horizon is completely flat as far up as we go. All amateur rockets and all amateur balloons sent up over 20 miles, as high as they can go. The horizon is flat all the way around, and it rises to the camera all the way up. You know, I hate to tell you this, but despite you saying it repeatedly, the horizon does not rise to your eye level. I mean, there it is right there in front of you. Look at the water level. You see how the water level at your eye level is above the level of those islands out in the ocean? Now you get up to 45,000 feet. The horizon drops by better than three degrees. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Anytime you've ever flown in an airplane, the wingtips on the airplane are level. You ever notice that the ground is below the wingtips? You know, come on guys, open your eyes and just look. There it is. It rises to the level of the camera. Now, this is totally impossible on a ball. No matter how big the ball was, as you rise up, you have to look down to see the curvature. Yes, that's the point that we're making. I mean, look at this right here. This is an airplane. The clouds are below the wings. The horizon's below the clouds. I mean, come on, guys. Look really? down to see the horizon. But what actually happens if you go up in a hot air balloon, the horizon rises right on up with you the whole way up. It just keeps on coming up at eye level as high as you're going to go. That's just impossible on a ball. If you think about it, if, the, if you're on a ball and you're in a hot air balloon or a, an airplane, you should not be able to see out your window, straight out your window, the horizon. You should have to look down, further and further down, the higher you ascend to be able to see that horizon. But hmm. you'll never look down to the horizon on the earth. Hmm. It will always rise up to your level. You know, Eric, how many times do you have to be shown these things for you to stop saying that the horizon rises to the eye level. You are absolutely correct. On a ball, the horizon will always be below your eye level. The horizon is below the eye level on Earth. What's that tell you about the Earth there, sunshine? So why is the UN, the USGS, why are these things, these official organizations using a flat earth map as their official map? Why does NASA admit to using geocentric calculations for their rocket launches? Um, why is the official 1892 uh, map Gleason's a flat earth map? You can check it out. People have uh, found it in the Boston library and other libraries. Um, there's plenty of flat earth maps. Mercator, the guy that gave us our projection map that we use in schools today, 
uh, his 1569 map is a flat Earth map uh, showing the North Pole um, being a magnetic mountain, something that is never shown nowadays in our maps. They just say the, the North Pole is a bunch of ice in the middle of an Arctic sea. In his map, it shows that there's these whole like island continents around the North Pole that don't exist on modern maps, and there's a magnetic mountain right at the middle. That doesn't exist on any map nowadays. You know, Eric, the reason that there's not a big magnetic mountain on the maps of the North Pole is that we have been to the North Pole, and there isn't a big magnetic mountain up there. As a matter of fact, the North Pole and the magnetic North Pole are two different locations. Now, the North Pole is different than the South Pole on your precious Gleason map. There is an actual location for the North Pole that you admit to. You can go there. We have gone there. There is no magnetic mountain. That's why it's not on the map. Now, the Gleason map, if you actually look at it, it is a projection map. Why is it a projection map? And what is it a projection of? It is a projection of the globe. Do you think Gleason didn't know the Earth was a globe? Do you think Gleason didn't know that his map was simply a projection based on the North Pole? Do you know that you can make that projection on any city you want or any location you want? So this is some interesting secrets in historic cartography if you look back at ancient maps. In fact, pretty much every map before the 1500s was a flat Earth map. This ball globe deception, this, this idea that we're on a ball, it's only been around for the past 500 years or so. Before that, pretty much every map in existence was a flat Earth map. Okay, Eric, I think that's about it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and close out on this map right here. This is my map of the world. Uh, this is my flat Earth map. It's centered on Sydney, Australia, and it's an AE projection. There's only one problem with it. As you can see, there's no ice rim around the outside, so the oceans keep leaking off, and we keep having to refill them. So, this is Bob the Science Guy. I'm going to sign out from Northern Michigan. Please remember to like and subscribe to my channel, and uh, I'll have another episode out on Friday. Thank you very much for tuning in. Take care, guys. This rabbit hole's too deep for me.